Welcome to the Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association's Patients Come First podcast. Joining us today, we're pleased to have Jonathan Bartels, a palliative care liaison nurse who works at the University of Virginia Medical Center. Welcome, Jonathan, and thanks for being with us. Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. By way of introduction, tell us a little bit about yourself outside of your work at UVA. Where are you from, your family, where you attended school, personal interests, things like that. So uh, I was born in Buffalo, New York, to a family. um, I'm one of seven kids and grew up most of my life in Buffalo, New York, and then ended up coming to Virginia when two of my brothers were physician residents at the University of Virginia Medical Center. And I came down uh, at a time that I needed to find work and was lucky enough to be able to uh, land at the University of Virginia Medical Center. I uh, am a father of four kids. Uh, My youngest is 18. He turned 18 today. And uh, my oldest is 24. And I uh, have been married about 26 years. I do facilitate meditation retreats, resiliency retreats for nurses that are training at the School of Nursing here at the University of Virginia. And I also have a hot sauce company that I help uh, to, to work with and and enjoy cooking that and making that with friends here. What's the name of the hot sauce? Uh, Mad Hatter Foods. Mad Hatter Foods, okay. And yeah. uh, also, happy birthday to your youngest, 18. Thank you. And a sister also turned 21 today. They were kind of twins separated by three years. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. I, I actually have two sisters who likewise are about six years apart, and they are also born on the same day. So, interesting. That's awesome. So tell me, uh, in your healthcare work, how many years have you been in the healthcare profession? I'm going on 30 years now in healthcare. I started when I was 18. I've done everything from being an orderly to being a full phlebotomist, and then eventually becoming a nurse, and then working in different areas of nursing throughout the uh, healthcare system, from med surge to uh, digestive health to emergency room and, and palliative care. And what prompted you? You mentioned that you have a family background in healthcare. What prompted you to get into healthcare and nursing specifically? So I was going to avoid healthcare altogether. As a young 18 year old, I remember one of the older nurses said, you know, don't ever, ever do this. This is too hard. Don't ever become a nurse. And so that kind of scared me away from even thinking about healthcare, even though I continued to work in it. But over the years, I was in graduate school in in Michigan, and I would call back home because my 34-year-old brother was dying of a glioblastoma. And hospice wasn't really present at the time, and so I kind of took on his hospice care, and I did vigil with him the night before he died. And that was a, a real turning point in my life. I ended up dropping out or leaving my graduate studies and making a complete turnaround and and going to nursing school and pursuing that degree as a nurse because I felt driven to offer the same type of care I offered my brother, but to offer that to other people's moms or brothers or sisters and give them the same kind of love I gave my own brother. And is it that same motivation that after three decades in healthcare is what keeps you engaged in the field. You mentioned that you're now in palliative care work, a very demanding profession, one that uh, can be challenging and rewarding. We know that you've worked in the emergency department where there are a lot of challenges treating patients who come in uh, with trauma and, and in crisis situations. Are those kinds of experiences what have kept you in healthcare all these years? They are. It's really a, a symbiotic relationship between me and my patients and between me and my coworkers, I learn and and get something by giving every day, but I also receive a lot from my patients in life lessons and learning to be more compassionate towards myself and towards others. And it's a process. I think we grow as humans the more we're exposed to these things. And over time, I'd like to think I've improved and gotten better at both caring for other people and caring for myself. A few years ago, you had a situation in the emergency room 
where you and your colleagues were to revive folks and resuscitate them. Uh, sometimes you were successful. Other times a person is unresponsive and unable to be revived, and I have to imagine that that is emotionally challenging. And out of that experience, you had something of a light bulb moment where you came up with a concept of how to honor someone who had, had been deceased and to also honor the work of the staff that had tried to revive that person. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I've been working for many, many years on health care. And throughout those years, there's always been this professional veneer that's always been a part of practice in healthcare. I think um, the more scientific we get, the, the more separate we get from the work that we do. And in even resuscitating and saving, we often really separate ourselves from that person in the bed because what we're trying to do is really get that heart started or to get that brain going again or to get them breathing again. And so we piecemeal often. And when we can't save that person, it affects us as healthcare providers because it's, it's, a, it's a loss. And we also understand that when it's someone's time, it's someone's time. And what I saw in doing that type of work over time, I saw that we weren't taking care of ourselves. We were simply walking away and going to our next patient and trying to forget about what we had just done, what we had just seen, and the real moment we were experiencing, the real moment we were a part of. We were a part of someone else's narrative. We were a part of their family's narrative, and we were a part of their own narrative. And, and how would we mark that? And I found that the traditional praying didn't necessarily meet the needs in a multicultural institution that I worked in. So I developed this practice, which I called the pause. And in pausing, we hold in silence. And in, in the silence, we honor in our own way so that you can have you know, someone who's Christian standing next to a Muslim, standing next to an atheist, standing next to a Buddhist, and they're all offering that same intent of honoring, but doing it in silence so that everyone has a voice. And in doing that, we also you know, share in that stopped time that the family is experiencing when they experience a loss of a loved one. And what's so great about that process it's, is its simplicity, its acknowledgement that it's important for the healthcare providers who are emotionally invested in trying to revive someone in acknowledging the life that has expired and also in acknowledging the emotional feelings that the providers are dealing with. And from what I understand, this process, which seems so intuitive, uh, spread beyond the ER spread into the curriculum and has spread to hospitals beyond the borders of Virginia. Can you tell me just a little bit about how far and wide this practice has gone now? Yeah, definitely. And you're right about the simplicity, and that's what really kind of drove me. When I did it, someone said, you've got to write this down. And I looked at them like they had three heads. I said, well, why would I write this down? This is normal, right? Doesn't everyone do this? And I realized in even asking the question, I had the answer. People don't, and they didn't. They needed permission to do it. And so I wrote an article, and this article ended up being distributed. And in the distribution, more and more people started hearing about it. And it led interviews on national radios, and it also uh, people started using it in their own lectures and presentations. And what it's done is taken on a life of its own. It was like a proverbial pebble thrown into an ocean. It's created a, a tsunami of compassion. More and more people are actually practicing, and in fact, it's being practiced in hospitals across the United States, and it's also being practiced in, in other parts of the world, including Australia, South Africa, Ireland, England, Sweden, Germany, and it all started with just one act. Well, thank you very much for sharing that. It's it's a great story, and it's, it's always a wonderful reminder to hear from folks like you who are dedicated and compassionate uh, health care providers, people that are treating our friends and neighbors in, in the community. So thank you. We're, we're glad to hear about the pause and glad to hear that it has caught on in the two-plus years since you came up with the idea. And, uh, and thank you for being with us today. 
Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. During this segment of the podcast, we like to share a healthcare story that we've either seen on TV or read in a newspaper or online, something that we found interesting and think that if you have a few moments to look up, it would be worth your while and something you might find interesting as well, particularly if you are interested in healthcare. So Aaron is going to join us and share one such story. Aaron? Thanks, Julian. Pets have a special way of providing happiness and joy. Mountain State's Health Alliance's standard poodle Willie is no different. Willie is the newest addition to the Regional Cancer Center, which is now offering pet therapy to patients. Mary Sunili, a patient at the Cancer Center, said even though treatment is tough, Willie makes the time go by much faster. Studies show that therapy dogs like Willie can help reduce fear, pain, anxiety, and stress in patients undergoing treatment. Willie is a trained, certified therapy dog. He trots around the facility once each week visiting eligible patients who want to see him. His handler, Christy Jones, said he can tell who needs him. He'll just walk right up and put his head on their lap. Mountain States Health Alliance offers pet therapy at all of its hospitals. This service is another example of how hospitals matter for community well-being. To read about this story, search for Mountain States Health Alliance and Willie the Poodle. That's going to do it for today's episode of the Patients Come First podcast. You can find new episodes as they become available at www.vhha.com. You can also find episodes of the podcast on SoundCloud. We also encourage you to engage with us on social media, including Facebook and Twitter. If you'd like to send us comments, questions, or feedback for the podcast, you can do that through our Twitter account at VirginiaHHA using the hashtag Patients Come First. Thanks. Thanks.